this item, this item is item 3 today's statements and job pass and minister you're very welcome and if you'd like to commence I want to thank the House for the invitation to outline my department's activation policies and in particular the important role of the job path initiative. Getting and keeping a job is the most effective way that people can be lifted out of poverty, achieve financial independence and have improved living standards. As a result of the improvement in the economy and the range of activation activities carried out by the Department of Social Protection, much progress has been made in helping people to return to employment and some people to get jobs for the first time. We are continuing with a range of programmes and job path, the subject of today's debate, is making a real difference for people who are long term unemployed. The results to date are very positive and the feedback from those who have participated in the initiative has also been positive in the clear majority of cases. The service is still in its early days and the employment outcome data, although promising, should be treated as preliminary. It will take quite some time to build up a definitive view of the service. A small number of poor experiences by participants can attract negative commentary and there will be always people who have a bad experience of any program, service or scheme. But I want to assure the House that independent reviews of outcomes to date of the initiative are very positive. The Government through the Action Plan for Jobs and the Pathways to Work strategy is targeting continued strong economic recovery and employment growth as well as ensuring that unemployed people benefit from the increases in employment. The action plan led by the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation creates jobs and pathways led by my department ensures that those who are in the live register get those jobs, or at least a fair share of them. The economic recovery is unusual in Ireland in that employment growth has been matched almost equally with the fall in unemployment. This has proved positive that pathways is, is a success. Generally, employment and unemployment falling is a lag indicator in economic recovery, with economic growth happening first employment rising later and unemployment only falling after that. In Ireland, unemployment has been falling since the beginning of the recovery and is falling as fast today as it has at any period in recent years. The most recent data show that unemployment has fallen from a peak of over 15% in 2012 to 6.6% last month, a rate which is lower than the EU average. The long-term unemployment rate peaked at 9.5% in the first quarter of 2012 before falling to only 3.6% uh, in the last quarter of last year. By the end of 2016, long-term unemployment accounted for 54% of all people unemployed, down almost 65% on where it was in 2012. The number of long-term unemployed in Q3 2016 was 80,000. This compares to 200,000 in early 2012. The job path service was designed to augment and complement my department's own existing employment service capacity which is provided by Intro, by the local employment services and jobs clubs, as well as employment activation schemes like CE2, Gateway and formerly JobBridge. The additional capacity provided through, through the job path service has allowed the department to provide the type and intensity of services required by job seekers, particularly those who are most distant from the labour market and find it hardest to get jobs and to keep them. Many more job seekers are getting one-to-one -one engagement than ever before. And while I appreciate for some that, it, that, uh, that attention may be unwelcome, for most it is welcome. So how does it work? The job path service is based on referral of long-term unemployed job seekers. For the purposes of the job path service, all long-term unemployed people in the live register are categorised into groups based on how long they've been unemployed. For example, one to two years, two to three years and so on. Selection for referral to job path is by means of a stratified random sampling using these groupings. The objective is to ensure equity in selection and that the people referred are representative of the long-term cohort on the live register. Selection is carried out by my department, not by the job path companies. My department refers each customer selected to job path uh, for a period of 12 months. Two contractors are delivering the service, Taurus Nua and SeaTech. Generally speaking, Taurus Nua provides services in the southern part of the country and SeaTech in the northern part and in Dublin. It is not unusual for government services to be provided through private companies by means of contracting or outsourcing. Indeed, many community employment scheme sponsors and CSPs are registered companies as well. And some, and some, some even turn a profit. The contractors provide services from locations that are accessible to the customer by public transport or private motorised transport with a normal journey time or commute of no less than 60 minutes. Where such services are not provided, my department will quickly engage with the provider to ensure that there are um, or that our clients are helped to access services. 
At a time when there is concern about the loss of post offices, banks and guard stations in rural Ireland and across small towns across the country, SeaTech and Turris Nua are opening new offices across the country, many in small towns, providing a local job service in those local towns for the first time and creating employment in their own right. The job path service providers, or provider rather, writes to each referred job seeker, inviting them to attend an initial information session presented jointly by an official from my department and a representative of the contractor. The letter of invitation includes a standard notification to the customer about the need to engage with the provider and the nature of the services and support that will be provided. The subsequent information session provides customers with information on customer rights and responsibilities, the job path program itself, the service provided by the contractor and a copy of the service statement. After attending the information session, customers are given an appointment for their first one-to-one -one meeting with a personal advisor. This meeting should take place as soon as possible after the information session. And the date of this first one-to-one -one meeting is the start date of the 52-week engagement period on the program. When meeting with their personal advisor, each customer receives a guaranteed baseline service, including a personal progression plan. The plan sets out the skills and competences of the customer, identifies any obvious barriers to employment, and helps the customer to identify their particular goals and interests in return to employment. With the job path service, job seekers have access to a personal advisor who works with them over two phases. The first phase, which lasts for up to a year, the advisor provides practical assistance in searching for, preparing for, securing and sustaining employment. The second phase starts when the job seeker is successful in finding work. During this phase, the personal advisor continues to work with the job seeker to provide any extra support they need for a period of up to 12 months. This helps the client to stay in employment and to hold on to their new jobs. It's a service we were never able to offer before. When my department refers a customer to JobPath, it requires the customer to engage appropriately with the service provider. The service provider is required to make every effort to encourage the customer to attend. Customers who don't attend or don't engage with the service can be referred back to the department by the service provider. In such cases, my department will examine the circumstances of non-attendance and seek to facilitate the customer's engagement. I want to stress, of course, that any, de any decision regarding entitlement or payments or payments being reduced or stopped can only be made by my officials of my department, officers designated by me uh, using statutory instruments, and not by the job pack companies. The rules are the same and apply to all job seekers. One must be genuinely seeking work to receive a job seeker's allowance or benefit. Taxpayers are willing to support people financially who are looking for work with their hard-earned tax euros but they should not have to pay for those who are making little or no effort to help themselves and find work. Job path is a payment by results model, so all initial costs are borne by the companies, the cost of their premises, their staff, etc. The companies are paid registration fees and job sustainment fees. A registration fee may be claimed only when a job seeker has developed a personal progression plan. Job sustainment fees are payable for every 13-week period of, of sustained employment up to a maximum of 52 weeks. Total payments to the job pad companies amounted to 26.8 million in 2016. The jobs must be full time, that is, more than 30 hours a week, with some exceptions. And this means job pad companies are incentivized financially to assist people to find full time jobs that they're likely to hold down and are therefore suited to. Precarious part time employment that is not sustained provides little or no revenue or profits to the companies concerned. The Department has recently published its performance report in JobPath, our first report. Uh, this should Senators wish to examine in more detail is available on our website. The initial data on the impact of the service is very encouraging, showing high levels of satisfaction among clients of the service. It shows that people who engage with the service are more likely to secure employment than those who do not. Employment outcome data shows that compared to a similar group of people who did not take part in the service, people who availed of the service were 23% more likely to have started a job. The difference is more marked and even better for very long-term unemployed people. For those out of work for more than three years, some 44% were more likely to have found a job if they participated in job path than, than others out of work for as long who were not referred. And again, these outcomes refer to full-time jobs of over 30 hours a week. In short, job path works. The results of an independent customer satisfaction survey recently undertaken indicates that job seekers feel they are receiving a good service and the job path has improved their chances of securing employment. 
between 76 and 81 percent of customers are satisfied with the service, and only between 5 and 8 percent expressed dissatisfaction. Over 90 percent said that job path staff made them feel valued and that they have a good relationship with their advisor. They also felt that the service had improved their chances of getting a job. The service was implemented on a phased basis from June 2015 to July, to July 2016. The numbers referred initially were low, but this is increasing with over 82,000 customers referred to date. As has always been the case, we don't allow people to chop and change midstream between different services, programs, courses or schemes. Job path is no different. If someone is unsuccessful after a year's effort in job path, they can become eligible for schemes like CE. This is a good approach as it means they've tried and have been supported to get a regular job before falling back on schemes like CE and TUS. It will take time to accumulate data on a sufficient number of clients who have completed their engagement period for a complete and robust assessment of the outcomes. The first statistics and outcomes were published in January 2017 and fresh statistics will be published on a quarterly basis with the next release available next month. Senators, the improvements in our economy are very encouraging and we're clearly experiencing a jobs-led and job-rich recovery. There are, however, no grounds for complacency, in my opinion. We know that it is hardest for those who are long-term unemployed to return to the workforce for a variety of reasons, and Job Path is one of the targeted measures introduced by my department to assist those returning to the workforce. So far, the results are encouraging and are exceeding expectations, and we hope to see continued successful deliveries of service in conjunction with other activation measures, including the local employment services, who now have their caseloads reduced, jobs clubs, community employment, and TUS. I want to thank uh, the House again for the opportunity to speak to you, and I look forward to hearing Senator's views. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Minister. Now, just for the benefit of members, uh, group spokespersons are entitled to speak for eight minutes, all other senators for five minutes, and if the debate has not already concluded, the Minister will be called at 8.05 with ten minutes uh, to conclude, and this statement must conclude by 8.15pm. Uh, so I'll call on our first uh, speaker, uh, Senator Catherine Arda. You have eight minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for addressing the House today on this important issue. Um, Cahir, look, uh, Fianna Fáil welcomes the fall in unemployment and the credit must go to the Irish people and Irish businesses that are responsible for the recovery. The recovery is due to their resilience, their skills, their hard work, their entrepreneurialism and their determination to move forward and secure a better future for themselves, their families and their communities. Despite the fall in unemployment, the recovery has not reached all sections of society and thousands remain unemployed many of which are long-term unemployed and in danger of remaining at the fringes of society, a spectator rather than a participant in their communities and in society at large. It is clear that a concerted effort must be made to make this an Ireland for all rather than an Ireland for certain people and certain sections of society. While Fianna Fáil are of course in favour of measures that support people back into employment, it is imperative that activation measures such as jobs, job path, job path are holistic in their approach, sensitive to people's needs and do not replicate the mistakes that were associated with jobs bridge, job bridge. Furthermore, Fianna Fáil does not support programmes that are punitive and coerce job seekers into unsuitable and inappropriate jobs. It must be recognised that those who are long-term unemployed or at risk of becoming unemployed may have a number of issues to make it difficult to enter the labour market. Therefore, it is essential that the Department puts checks in place to ensure that the two private companies, that is, SeaTech Limited and Taurus Nua, that have been charged with delivering the job, job path are trained and aware of factors such as mental health issues, family breakdown, substance misuse that may impact a person's ability to work. At the heart of any activation programme must be the individual and their particular needs. It is important that the, the department, your department minister, continuously engages with all stakeholders involved in the activation in order to, to improve it. Minister, you have outlined how the programme works and the benefits associated with the programme. Some of my colleagues um, have, um, have, who have instigated this debate have um, raised concerns in relation to job path. Um, one of the major concerns is in relation to not being able to access CE schemes as, jobs, as job path takes precedence over the, over, over the, over the choice of, of, taking on a, of, of, of entering a CE scheme. Uh, 
Concerns have been raised that those who, who are referred to JobPath can no longer participate in CE schemes. Public representatives, Minister, all across the country have received, have received complaints from people who have been offered a place on a CE scheme but are then subsequently referred to JobPath and must participate in that rather than take up a place on a CE scheme. Many of those people who have contacted their public representatives would prefer a place on a CE scheme and in many instances a, C, a CE scheme would be more appropriate and suitable to their, to their needs. Furthermore, it has been claimed that JobPath is eroding CE schemes to the detriment of communities and those who benefit from vital services that CE schemes provide throughout the country. It has been reported that CE schemes cannot fill vacancies because of JobPath. In December 2016, the manager of Offaly Centre for Independent Living in a presentation claimed that JobPath is causing untold damage to existing community employment schemes. At a meeting, it was claimed that many CE schemes have vacancies which they cannot fill and JobPath is being blamed for suffocating them of a supply, removing a referral process and imposing even more stringent constraints on the eligibility criteria. CE schemes have grown to develop a great social and economic benefit and we must be mindful of the impact that JobPath is having on them. Whilst the goal is, of course, to move the majority of people into full-time sustainable employment, we need to be cognizant that a one-size-fits-all approach is not suitable for everybody and there needs to be a degree of flexibility in the activation system, in the activation system and an awareness of people's age, skill set, previous, previous experience and their needs and goals. The social welfare system should not completely remove a person's right to choose and should be flex flexible enough to allow people, if they have the choice, to choose between a CE scheme or a job path. To conclude, Minister, I'd like to thank you for coming in today and note the customer satisfaction survey in relation to the job path. It is so much better, as you say, than job bridge. And um, although the findings are very encouraging, especially in relation to staff friendliness and engagement, we know that there is very much room for improvement and I look forward to hearing how your department will take on um, the concerns I've raised and um, improve the scheme. Thanks very much, Senator Arda. Uh, our next speaker is Senator Ger Crockwell and you have eight minutes. Uh, to the last here. Look, Minister, um, I want to thank you for coming into the House today to discuss this important issue. Um, before I would issue uh, our offer any criticism, I must first and foremost congratulate the Department. The Department has done a lot of good work over a long number of years in providing access to further education and training for members of uh, our society. Indeed, I benefited from the support of the Department myself when I returned to college in 1990, and I will be forever grateful for the support and the assistance and the humane approach taken by officials I dealt with in the Department of Social Protection. Way outside the political system, there was no political question whatsoever. This was directly a member of the public dealing with the Department, and indeed it's my view, Minister, that's the way it should always be. The officials in the Department are well capable of doing the job without in interference from politicians. However, any scheme that brings people back into the workforce, that allows people to upskill and retrain must have the full support of all sides of this house. Any scheme. There is no scheme yet developed that will be perfect in every way. There will always be complaints. There will always be a better way of doing things. There will always be somebody who knows better than everybody else. And that's fine. I have no difficulty with that. It's what allows these schemes to evolve and move forward and to deliver better programmes. And again, I will again compliment the Department. You get a kick in a fair enough time uh, in departments. But the Department have been innovative, far-seeing and cooperative when it comes to dealing with programmes. There are, however, political decisions that need to be taken. And when we look at this particular programme, we talk about CTEC and we talk about Tuas Nua. These are two English companies. Two English companies, Minister, with Irish names, particularly in the case of Tuas Nua. Look at their website. Look at who they report to. It saddens me that we're having offices opened by these companies all over the country when we have a perfectly good Education and Training Boards Ireland capable of delivering programmes at the highest level. 
It saddens me when we, are, we have a further education sector, which I entered in 1990, which had its origins in 1988, and it still is struggling to find its position in Irish society. The abolition of force and the uh, uh, commencement of solace has gone a long way. But ETBI, the Education and Training Boards Ireland, the 16 boards around the country, can do so much. They need to be included in this scheme. They need to be right in the middle of this scheme. Some of the back to education initiatives, excellent in the idea, but not enough financial support. It's my view, and always has been my view, that people who find themselves unemployed for whatever reason should be offered a pathway back to work through education and training. And the ETBI and each one of the ETBs around the country have been exceptional in meeting the needs of um, the, the unemployed. Indeed, the uh, uh, guidance service that is available now in every community is excellent at helping people identify their short skills. It's not your place for me to discuss issues with respect to people going back to study a level 5 where they already have a level 7, 8 or 9. That's, that's an issue for the Minister for Education and I'll discuss that with him at some stage in the not too distant future. But I would ask you, Minister, to ask your department to engage more with ETBI. I'm not saying they don't engage. They do engage, but they need to engage more. Instead of opening new offices, let's utilise what's there already. We have 17 further education and training colleges in the country. We need to integrate the training into those colleges. We need to integrate education and training further, and I know Solace is working towards that. I know some of my former colleagues, and speaking as a former president of the Teachers' Union of Ireland, I know that there will be difficulties in doing that. But the Teachers' Union of Ireland was never afraid to negotiate. They were never afraid to meet the department halfway, and they have proved that in the recent negotiations on the Lansdowne Road Agreement. But I would beg you a couple of things. Engage with ETBI, get them involved. Engage with the small training companies in the country that maybe are only offering three or four offerings. I understand from some of the very small uh, trainers, for example, people who specialise in just health and safety and nothing else, they're finding it hard to meet some of the requirements that are being laid down. I'm not sure whether that falls at the door of Solis or whether it falls at the door of your department. I'm not sure, and that's, that's something that we need to look into. Um, but, look, I'm not going to take any more time other than to say to you and your officials, keep, keep doing what you're doing, but please keep one ear open all the time for suggestions. And please engage with ETBI and see how much of the demand that you have for your clients can be met through the further education and training sector, because I believe that they can deliver everything you need and more besides. I would not be here today but for the chance that I got in 1990 in Limerick Senior College, which was at that stage, and I know my colleague Senator Byrne is a passionate um, guardian of that college. It's Limerick College of Further Education now, and without the start I was given in Limerick, I would never have made it to President of the TUI or anywhere else. So I will be forever grateful to the Education and Training Boards and the Irish Vocational Education Association before that and the Department of Social Protection who were, went more than a mile to meet me. So, Minister, carry on with what you're doing and thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Senator Crockwell. And the next speaker is Senator Ray Butler and you have eight minutes. I'd just like to welcome the Minister in this evening. In 2011, the programme for government contained a commitment to replace FOSS with a new National Employment and Entitlement Service. In the subsequent project plan published by the Department of Social Protection for what became INTRO, it was stated the Department would explore the potential to argument inter internal resources through the de Department, outsourcing some of the elements of the service. What emerged was JobsPath, a model of contracting the provision of employment services for those individuals who are long-term unemployed. The Pathways to Work incentive launched in 2012 signalled the potential of contracting with third-party providers to complement and argument the existing capacity of the Department of Social Protection and that, and that already delivering under contract arrangements with local employment services providers to deliver employment services. 
The jobs plan contract model was designed over a two-year period, taking account of advice from Irish and international experts on contracting of employment services and inputs received following a number of public uh, stakeholder consultation briefings. The Department retained the services of the Non-Profit Centre of Economic and Social Inclusion London to advise on the jobs pack model and the procurement process. The key objectives were of jobs pack is to help people find and abstain paid employment to the quality of an outcome payment the service providers must help job seekers find jobs for at least 30 hours per week that are sustained for at least 13 weeks. Outcome payments, known as subsequent fees, are paid out for each 13-week period of the employment for up to a year. Jobs Pat is a, is a payment by res, results model, which means that the companies will not be able to fully recover their costs until they place su sufficient numbers of job seekers in su sustainable jobs. Therefore, the overall cost of the Jobs Pat will be determined by the number of people who participate in the programme and the number who get sustainable jobs. Payments of the job PAT companies amounted to 1.2 million in 2015. Payments to the jobs PAT companies amounted to 29 million in 2016, and it is estimated in 2017 that that will be 65 million. This increase in the expenditure profile reflects the phased rollout of the services and also the, uh, the culmination of outcome fees over time. It is unlikely the expenditure will exceed £65 million in any given year. The contracts between the Department and Social Protection and the service providers are for a f period of four years or an additional two years run out period. This means that where a person commences engagement with a jobs pat provider, at the end of the fourth year the provider must provide the services for the next 52 weeks and if the person secures employment at the end of that 52 weeks the provider may claim payments in respect of the provision of an employment support for up to 52 weeks thereafter. The department at its sole discretion has reserved the right to extend the internal four year referral period for up to another um, two years. The key messages about jobs pat is the level of job pat complaints is very, very low. All complaints have been resolved and are in the process of being resolved. The response to the jobs pat has been quite positive and relative to the number of clients referred to the service. There have been as few concerns raised at this point, concerns that have been raised, such as moving to C schemes, have been addressed. To date, the number of complaints received only re represents just over one quarter of one percent of the 82,000 job seekers who have started their engagement period with the service. Most complaints were from people who were reluctant to engage with the jobs pat. Each participant gets a service statement at their intern engagement and it, it outlines the level of services that they can expect. Each company has its own complaints process. If clients lodge a complaint directly to the department, such complaints are referred back to the company in the first instance for intel investigation in the line of contractual arrangements. Department inspectors visit provider premises both with and without notice to test compliance and contact contract terms. The department recently commissioned customer satisfaction service to independently assess if customers are satisfied with the level and the quality of service delivered. The results from the service indicated that job seekers feel they are receiving a good service under jobs pat. 76 to 81 percent satisfaction versus 5 to 8 percent dissatisfaction. And on a personal note, I would like to say that emotionally and especially mentally without having a job or reason to get out of bed in the morning was huge during the recession and I have to say that 
things have been very, very positive when it comes to jobs, Pat. So it keeps people, uh, uh, gives them opportunity, builds their confidence and provides a, a, a sense of self-worth. So I would like to congratulate the, the Department and the Minister. Uh, thanks very much, Senator Butler. Uh, next speaker is uh, Senator Cumbie Walsh. And Senator Devine, are you sharing times? Yes, please. Yeah. Can I have four five and minutes? Four, five and three? Yeah, yeah five okay, and, and three. Okay, and I'll signal after when you have one minute okay. left. Grant, thank Go you. Ahead. And thank you, Minister, for coming to the House to discuss this very important uh, issue. Uh, I'll get straight to the point. I know you're a busy man. Uh, I have a number of questions which I've been unable to get the answers to despite numerous attempts. And the first one is, how much has the programme cost to date? And that is the programme including the whole tendering process, the use of economic research specialists and the legal costs around it. Can you please give us a figure for that? I'm sure you have it with you today, knowing that we were going to be discussing um, this. How much will the programme cost the taxpayer by the end of the year four or five um, cycle? Are there any breaks or penalty clauses if the government decides to pull out of this contract uh, early. Can you explain how it could be acceptable that the basic requirement even to be considered eligible to bid for job path was that a company had a minimum turnover of 20 million per year which excluded many local Irish companies and voluntary organisations from the scheme. With these companies driven by profit and wanting to ensure the full payment can be drawn down, there is a danger that the long term harder to reach unemployed are overlooked in favour of those who are more ready to slip back into certain employment sectors. I'm particularly concerned for those who are most distant from the labour market or individuals with issues uh, around alcohol or substance misuse or mild depression. So could you confirm, Minister, that if a client has mental health issues or any kind of disability, uh, they are referred back to the department? I'm also concerned that outlying rural areas will be abandoned in the drive for profit maximisation in the name of efficiency, effectiveness and value for money. Did the Department consider reviewing the LES contracts the time to deal with the demand in the recession? Um, there is also the issue for those selected for job path are being forced to travel miles to access services that are provided in local LES offices. This doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense to have two British companies over here opening offices so, uh, to, to duplicate the work that's already been done by the LES offices. I worked in this area myself and it just does not make sense to me. And I know the figures that are being presented and that, that, that were presented by the, my former speaker here, but it does not, it belies what is coming back on the ground. It belies the anecdotal evidence around it and we need to have a proper look at uh, those figures and at the report in terms of how many were sampled, over what duration and all of, and all of that. Um, how can we expect the local employment service to compete with companies that are for profit are being widely promoted by, the thir by third parties, two third parties, by the government and the Department of Social Protection? And it seems that all the referrals are being sent to job path rather than the, the LES. And there's another issue around the youth guarantee where the government secured substantial EU funding uh, under the youth guarantee to put in place innovative measures and preventative programmes to address issues regarding training, education and employment for the under 20 Fives to prevent long-term unemployment. It now appears nationally that the under 25s who are unemployed for more than 12 months are being sent to jobs path. Maybe you can clarify that. The issue here is that the under 25 target group was not part of the, job, the original job path contract. The question, Minister, is what uh, was the EU funding under the youth guarantee used for and what results were achieved and what value for money audits have been done? I put it to you, Minister, that what uh, uh, people want is jobs and real jobs and jobs particularly in rural areas and jobs in my own areas. Time and time again it said to me all that we need in this area is that a, 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 a sufficient number of people would have a wage packet at the end of the week to stimulate the economy and to put money into households. And the final question is, is the job path, is job path the activation monster that follows the Irish water monster? We want to know how much is it costing, how much has it costed to set up, why are two British companies delivering what could very uh, well be delivered uh, by uh, the, the local employment uh, services in the country. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Senator Cobalt. And I'll give you the remaining time, Senator Devine. Go Good, Margot. I probably won't take long in, in that it's uh, 
Minister said it started in one of his quotes was uh, it's not unusual for this uh, to be outsourced and, and indeed some even returned for a profit. So there's so much wrong with that statement, Minister. I don't know really how to start. Um, it just comes from a platform of the government uh, and, uh, enabling and uh, paying on behalf of the taxpayer uh, private companies, foreign private companies, to provide jobs that my colleague, uh, Senator Conway Walsh, said is we're so capable of doing here and using our own money to pay these, pay these companies to make profits from. Uh, that's the difference, I guess, between the two of us. You come from a neoliberalism agenda which is the polar opposite to what I would like to see is investing in our people and in investing in public services and public delivery with our own money, our taxpayers' money that provide these services. There's so many issues with Job Path Minister. I, I still liken it to the jobs breach. I'm not sure exactly where we're going to get differences in it. Uh, first of all, from my investigations, we're missing vital financial information to conduct a full analysis of the scheme, leaving us in a position only to analyse with estimates, estimates given, obtained uh, by bits and pieces of information drip fed to us by the Department over time, including yours and previously in statements and interim reports. One such analysis was the January 2017 report. Between July and September 2015, it seemed that a taxpayer paid 1,043 registration fees to these private companies for 305 people, 305 people to get employed. Of course, the Department will not release the price of these registration fees, but in December 2015, an estimated 12 million was given as the total spend on job path for 2015. Taking July and September as half of this time period, you can only assume then that approximately six million was spent in this duration. Six million for 305 people to get a job. Are these estimates correct, Minister? Do you believe this to be value for money? What about the 26.8 million that was spent on this scheme in 2016, compared to the 20 million given to the LES? Why are privately owned schemes getting more? Referrals to LES are down 10,000. Have these 10,000 people gone on to job path instead where we've had to pay extra to fulfil the profit desires and the pockets of privately owned companies? One minute. Please, Minister, I don't want the commercial sensitivity answer. There are people there who cannot fulfil the CE schemes that provide vital community services. Um, I just concur with what my colleague, Senator Conway Walsh, has said, and I hope you can answer some of the questions. Gormagal. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Devine. And I'd just like to acknowledge that the presence in the, in the public gallery of a, a very long serving former councillor, uh, Michael Donnelly, and a group who's with him. So you're very welcome to the Senate. I'm sure we all extend a welcome to him. And now we'll just continue on with the debate. Um, the next speaker is Senator John Dolan, and you have eight minutes. Margot, and welcome, Minister. And I'm happy to be involved, being involved, and have the opportunity to be involved in this um, debate. You stated at the beginning that job, you talked about the job-led and job-rich recovery. The people I'm particularly interested in, that does not resonate with them. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, comments and the input from Senator Arda very strongly resonates with a lot of the things that I'd say in terms of people with disabilities, different conditions and whatever, and the, the issues about job path vis-a-vis uh, -vis CE schemes. So we have from the ESRI just in the last few days, authored by Dorothy Watson, and let me give a flavour of it. 31% of working age people with a disability were at work compared to 71% of those without a disability. For those without a disability, the rate of job entry picked up in the recovery period and the rate of exit dropped. However, there was little sign of a recovery for people with a disability by 2015. Overall, the odds of employment entry are nearly four times lower for people with a disability. People with a disability remain about half as likely to enter employment. The odds of employment exit are twice as high for people with a disability. This is the ESRI. This isn't me with a hunch. Government policy, and these are the, implication, the uh, implications that the ESRI see here. Government policy 
is there to facilitate the employment of people with a disability who want to work an estimate additional 36,000 people with disabilities? And their calculations show that if all people with a disability who wanted to work had a job, half of them would be at work instead of 31%. And some areas of specific importance that I want to note. The retention of medical cards when people move into employment. Support for the additional costs of disability itself. And flexibility in how jobs are structured, including the hours uh, 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 and job tasks. Ensuring that there's equal treatment in access to services such as health, transport and other areas. These are what I call the determinants of employment for people. Health, social services, cost of disability payment, cost of getting to work, transport, training, education. I go back to the early 80s in my involvement in the area of disability and indeed in the involvement uh, in the area of training and employment for disabled people. I remember a scheme called Teamwork. I remember the community employment schemes, the social employment schemes and the more recent ones. And vis-a-vis -vis the jobs path and CE programs, let me say this from my own gut and my own experience. The possibility for somebody to be doing something particularly in their local community with people they know and in organisations they know, often community, sports, disability groups or whatever, is the real deal maker for those people to be able to go on and get into employment because they, they have the encouragement from people they know in that place. I've, I've, in the Irish Wheelchair Association, I've seen those people go on to jobs in the open labour market because somebody said to them, there's a job, go, would you, would you apply for it? And somebody will take them literally, if you like, by the hand and encourage them and work with them. That is how it works. And I know, and again, Senator Arda has mentioned it, the issue of, of, of uh, um, job paths. In a sense, suffocating or colonising the possibility of people going into CE programmes when they want to. We know there are some people who would go the other way if you offered them an opportunity for training or work. But there are people who want it and who want to do it and surely we should be finding every way we can um, to make that, to make, make that happen. Um, the comprehensive employment strategy for people with disabilities should have been in place in January, February 2013. It didn't come to the light of day until the 2nd of October 2015 in the wake of a general election. Um, it now has its first annual report about to be made public, <clears throat> 18 months after it started. And I, I, the, 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 some of the issues that are being raised there uh, by the chairman and indeed others, the, the government needs to make a significant start in implementing its public service-wide commitment to a 6% six, uh, 6 quota. And the issue, an allied issue, the possibility of acti activation without real prospects is disingenuous. People need that chain of opportunity. If people with disabilities can't move into the workspace, there has been huge improvements in the area of education in the last decade and a half. And that's good and it's I dare I say it's bad in another sense because if those people at the, get to leave insert, get not to being able to go on to the ETB or go into college, they fall back into a HSE day program or one run by one of the voluntary organisations. That's a killer for people. There must be ways found to keep them on the trajectory into employment and, and into, act, uh, and into um, activity. The CSO, um, th this time last year, or sorry, last summer, Minister, in the run-up to the budget, I, I was pressing you um, for a package that would particularly support people with disabilities in terms of income supports and cost of disability payment, which is part of the issue in terms of getting back into work. You said you didn't favour a particular increase for, for people with disabilities or particular groups. What happened in the budget was a 5% for the 5 euro increase across the board, very welcome for everybody. On the 1st of February this year, I want to draw to your attention, the CSO brought out statistics that said, and thankfully said,
that the route out of poverty was beginning to work for the general population. There was some bit of an improvement for people. But in its next sentence, in the next sentence it said, people with disabilities are falling strongly further into poverty. That is a real issue. Employment, transport issues, and other related supports, and training in particular. So I am calling on you very strongly to look very specifically at this area. We've seen over the recession a lot of disabled people, what I call designed out of activation programs, because there were people who had become unemployed during the recession. There now needs to be a major start and tailored, if it needs to be, programs for people with disabilities and mental health needs so that they can get, so that they can get moving in that direction. We've invested so well and more needs to be done in terms of education. That becomes less of an investment if we can't keep people moving in the right direction. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Cahirla. Um, Senator Maria Byrne, you have five Thank minutes. You. Thank you very much indeed, um, Cahirlach, and just to welcome the Minister here and to thank you for your detailed presentation. I suppose there's been a lot of discussion here this evening in relation to job paths, but I'm only going to speak from my own experience and the people that I've come across, um, I suppose, who come into my office who have been in terms of long-term unemployed. Um, the experience that I would have had to date, I suppose, has been with Turis Nua because uh, they're the ones that operate below in the Limerick area. And certainly I do know that it's a lot more positive. I think there has been a lot of changes made that have been very, very positive, certainly in terms of what people experienced in the past. Um, people who were uh, long-term unemployed, you know, when they went into social welfare or whatever, while they had a good experience, they find that I think the fact that they're now being given designated officer and that that person works with them for the 12-month period, I think that is very, very positive because they're building up a relationship, whereas in the past they may have gone in and they met a different person every time. The fact that they're now building a relationship with that person um, I know, Kyle here, look, when you made your own contribution, you referred to the fact of the training boards, but my understanding is that they are being encouraged uh, once that 12 months are up to go to retrain and to upskill, and the ETB boards are playing a very important role in terms of that training. And I do think that certainly there is engagement, but maybe there should be more engagement, and perhaps you're right, you know, I mean, um, but there are a number of people who are now going back to training who are now upskilling that would never have seen themselves in, in that, um, I suppose, in that frame of mind before. Um, they found it a very, very positive experience. I read with interest the report which you have in your website. I know since January 2017 it was the first quarterly report. And the fact that it was so positive, I think, and, and certainly I know from speaking to people that's the, the positive reaction that I'm getting from people who certainly have been um, on the job path. I also met two people who actually uh, signed up and have now been offered full-time jobs as a result of, of the scheme that they were on and where they were actually placed on their job path uh, placement. And th they, they have subsequently been offered full-time jobs within the companies where they were. So, I mean, they, they, they were very, very positive about the whole training experience. And they're also upskilling and training at the same time. Also, another thing that I, I think with this one-to-one, -one, um, as well as cooperation between the, the uh, person in terms of that they're dealing with, the, the fact that they're being shown how to um, upskill their CVs, how to present their CVs, and also um, things around confidence and motivation. And I think a lot of people, when they were unemployment for, unemployed for so long, you know, things they were lacking in was confidence and um, maybe the motivation. So certainly, I think, you know, the, 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 the fact that people are, that their, their um, mentor, we call them, is working with them on a one-to-one -one basis, certainly is working. Um, the fact that there has been very little negativity, I think, around the scheme as well. And just, I know that there is a fear that um, we'll say that people aren't there for the C schemes, but I think it's down to the fact that our employment is so low now as well, you know what I mean? And, and that is very, very positive in terms of the fact that um, there is approximately 
less than 7% unemployment now in the country, so that's, that's a, a sign. And I mean, I know, I'm sure, Minister, that it's something that you're reviewing in the department as well, as to encourage people, you know, to come back into training and, and that, and to go into employment, even if it's only for the short term. But I think not everybody is suited to a CE scheme and maybe not the same people, some of them aren't uh, suited to a job path because there are slight differences between the two and that's from my own experience of, of um, dealing with people. But I think the fact as well that, that people are being assessed for their suitability and they're trying to put them in schemes where, where they are suitable and taking their skill set in, into um, into consideration. And just um, certainly, I, all I can say is that, um, and also I know that there was another fear as well around data protection, but I understand that it's just, the data protection is securely, um, we'll say, used just in terms of placing people on, in their relevant uh, positions. So just, I, I do think that it has been positive. Yes, there probably are a few things that need to be done in terms of maybe greater upskilling and training, while there is some there, and just to welcome it in a positive light. Thank you. Senator Byrne. Uh, Senator Alice Mary Higgins, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, Minister, for the opportunity to, to uh, discuss job path. Um, and I do recognise that it is one part in a, a very comprehensive set of uh, other measures which we are discussing uh, and I have the opportunity to discuss at the Social Protection Committee. Um, uh, I suppose I would have just two or three kind of questions um, in relation to job path. Uh, one concern that I, I would have, uh, I would appreciate the opportunity to have it addressed, is in respect of job path saw a very rapid scaling up. I mean, the scale of, I think it was uh, 60,000 was talked about as the number of cases that would be processed through that it's a very large scale project. If we look to, for example, some of the other initiatives and schemes um, which have taken place in, you know, in Ireland and some of the schemes which we've ro rolled out, um, the scale up was not on this, in this level. So I'm a little bit, and the, and the other concern I have is uh, the fact, which I'm sure has been dealt with and discussed at length earlier, and I apologize for my lateness in joining the debate, um, the fact that it is contracted to private service deliverers uh, in CTEC and Thuris Nua. Um, and I, I might come to my macro concern and then to the micro concern. On the wider level, my concern would be, given that we are invent, uh, taking this very new step um, and we are taking it on such a wide scale, how potentially reversible or changeable is it? So my question would be that we know that under the public procurement legislation at European level, um, that there is the right of states to exclude certain health and social services from the area of competition and public procurement competition. Um, my concern would be, has there been an analysis about whether having job path uh, um, tendered out effectively and delivered by private contractors uh, potentially uh, diminishes our right to reserve public delivery um, and public, in, in, you know, therefore through public delivery as well, public accountability of these services. And to what extent, if, if after we've um, uh, engaged in this new, um, in this experiment, if it is to be found, because a lot of the, the, the rationale, as I understand, initially was around capacity, and of course it was taking place at a time of kind of coming out of a very significant public service free, recruitment freeze, if we were to decide as a state that we want to move back to a period of in fact recru recruiting uh, frontline and increasing the capacity of frontline caseworkers within our public system and delivering the services through that route. How would that be managed? Is, you know, what is the analysis as to whether that would be analysed and how would that fit within our European public procurement contracts? Because I, I am concerned that at the time when JobPath was first being introduced, concern was raised by community groups in respect of this issue. They were told that they had to contact this out because Europe required it, but Europe did not in fact require it. So the fact that there was a little bit of misinformation around this issue at the very beginning is a concern. Another core concern at JobPath from the beginning is that uh, there seems to be a very small percentage of allocation to the capacity and training of uh, staff. The training and skill level of staff didn't seem to get maybe as high a weighting as I believe it could have done in the allocation of contract. Moving just to the, to the core issue of the operation of job path, and I appreciate we will all hear positive stories, but the natural the scale of it, we will hear all kinds of stories of positive and negative. Um, but I guess a, a, a couple of key concerns I have is 
the routing through because of this random selection process, is it delivering the appropriate casework? And having heard in the Social Protection Committee from the Labour Market Council, they talked of the fact of one of the key concerns is uh, in respect of where people are being routed wrong, maybe not being routed to the job that is most maximising most uh, and towards a career which is most progressive towards them. That was a wider concern. And also the concern of the focus on a jobs first approach. What we heard at the Social Protection Committee is that we need to look potentially at giving a stronger weighting now to education first and to training. And my concern is the opportunities for education and training um, for, those who are, for those who are participating in this. If people decide, for example, they want to reroute into back to education allowance, or if people do find a C scheme, and I accept we need better progression models out of our C schemes, how can someone exit job path and re-enter a more appropriate skill? There is also the concern, of course, of the conversations that are had between job path providers as commercial providers um, and other companies and corporations. We've seen some concerning issues that have arisen, for example, in relation to FIS and others, which I won't dwell on now, in respect to conversations between employment services and employers. And it's very important that the individuals... Uh, that the service is there essentially to serve the individuals and not to serve, for example, preferred companies, uh, particularly as well if those companies have poor employment practices. So I, I guess the question is, who is it appropriate for these companies to be working with and what way should they be appropriately working for that? Um, there is also the question of sanction. I know the Minister has specified that sanction takes place within interview offices and not through job hack, but nonetheless there is a very strong perception and concern that if one does not take up a role recommended through a job path um, caseworker that you may be vulnerable to sanction and to concern. And I believe that is a concern that needs to be addressed. And the last, very last point I would say is, in this focus on the live register, are we again missing the opportunity for the many thousands of people who may on a voluntary basis wish to access employment services but do not want to enter a system with the potential for sanction, with these kind of rigid targets, and with potentially a more rigid set of potential outcomes. So the local employment services, which I believe did a very exemplary job in many parts of Ireland. Thank you, Senator. I thank you very much. Um, I am concerned that they were open to all of those, including those not on the live register. I believe that is potentially where we should be refocusing our energy, again, without uh, sanction, but encouraging voluntary engagement, including for the many women, of course, who have fallen out of our live register system. Senator Boyne, do you wish to offer? No, I'm... Minister. Thanks, um, thanks very much. Thanks for um, uh, a very, very interesting and, and I think broadly constructive debate. And uh, I'll do my best to answer as many questions as I had the answer to. And um, I, I may not have jotted them all down, but I'll do my best to cover as many issues as I can. Uh, I should say at the outset that um, a job path doesn't take precedence over CE. It's just that we don't allow people to switch from one scheme or program to another. We don't want somebody spending a month on CE and suddenly going on to TUS or two months on TUS and then going on to Gateway. You know, we don't want people chopping between different schemes and programs. If somebody has a start date for a CE scheme within four weeks, um, for, you know, within, if they have a date to start within the next four weeks, they can go on the CE scheme. But I suppose we don't want people is people who could have gone on a CE scheme for three years when they get referred to job path suddenly finding an interest in going on a CE scheme and, and I've come across plenty of examples of that and of course ideally what we want to move to is a jobs first model which we are moving to whereby people initially try to get a job and spend the first year trying to get a job or being supported to get a job uh, and when they aren't able to get a job then the most appropriate place for them is CE uh, and schemes similar to um, uh, similar to that. Uh, it is the case absolutely that a lot of C schemes are having real difficulty filling vacancies. It's something I'm very concerned about. I, I don't want to see uh, the very important service provision provided by C schemes like Meals on Wheels, like Tidy Towns, uh, like Child Care, some of the social care they do. I think a lot of that should be done properly, by the way, through other government agencies and other government departments, put it that way, but that, that's, that's a battle I'll have to have my colleagues um, in, in time to come. But I certainly don't want to see well, I'd like to see some of those services tra transition to normal employment uh, and normal services. I certainly don't want them to fall by the wayside. And I'm determined to make sure that that, doesn't, that isn't the case because of, of the real value of that kind of work, whether it's you know, fixing pitches, different things like that, which is really important, and all of us know it in our constituencies. But the reason why um, C schemes and two schemes are having difficulty recruiting, uh, of course, isn't solely down to job path. There's a much bigger story here. We had this many C schemes. 
then we increased them by about 10,000. 10, then we added Tooth, then we added Gateway, then we added JobBridge, and then we have JobPath. So you've seen a nearly quadrupling of the services and schemes available. Meanwhile, unemployment down by half. So like, what do you expect to happen? Of course, uh, it's going to be harder to fill these places. Unemployment's down by half, if not down by more than half. The number of schemes and services has increased dramatically. Uh, and that's the reason as to why we're having difficulty, or I see schemes having difficulty uh, filling places. Um, but I do want to do something about it. Um, and what I do want to do, and I'm working on this at the moment with my colleagues, is to widen the pool of people who are eligible for CE. So, for example, younger people who currently aren't eligible, um, people who are timed out because of a rule that says you can only serve so many years on CE schemes, being able to take part in schemes again, uh, and then particularly people who have been through the year of job path. And lots of people now, tens of thousands of people have been through their year with job path and haven't got a job. They're the ones who we should be particularly encouraging uh, to go into um, CE. And we need to challenge CE supervisors in particular and, and, um, and, uh, and sponsors not to try to hang on to the person that they're necessarily comfortable with, who's doing a great job and doesn't need much, doesn't need much help from them. What we need to challenge them to do is actually go out and find the people who have not got a job with job path, who are on disability, who are lone parents, who are on, on other long-term payments, uh, and try to encourage them to um, uh, take up these places. And I think one thing that would really help in that regard, but obviously it's a matter for the next budget, uh, is increasing the top-up, the people who participate on these schemes get. It's about 2250 at the moment. It's not an awful lot. Uh, if you participate in, in a CE scheme, for example, um, or a two scheme, um, and you get this additional payment by the time you've maybe covered the cost of lunch two or three days a week or the cost of transport, you may even be worse off. Um, and that's, I think, something that I'd like to see um, dealt with in the next budget if, if I can get the, um, the, the, finance, the, finance, um, the finance for that. Um, JobPath does represent a policy shift. It is a job-first approach, and the idea is to try and get people um, work in the first instance. Uh, and also to accept the fact that it's quite normal, and I'm sure most of us have done it in our, our lives and careers, for people to be in work and at the same time uh, be involved in training and education, whether it's part-time, at night, at weekends. We've probably all done it uh, in our time, uh, being in employment and at the same time um, um, uh, being in training or further education. And, of course, when you go to get a job, that's the kind of person an employer wants. Employers are pretty sceptical about people who spend their entire lives going from training scheme to training scheme, back to welfare, another training scheme. And we have a carousel sometimes of people who spend 10 years, perhaps, on a carousel of training schemes, back to welfare, maybe a C scheme, more welfare, a training scheme, and they don't get jobs. And the jobs, the jobs first approach that's being, um, that we're implementing now is actually a much better one, in my view. But, of course, there are lots of exceptions, and I think we do need to accept that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to any of these things. Uh, in terms of the companies be, being British or English, uh, I don't think it's accurate to characterise them solely in that way. Uh, Terrace New, for example, is headquartered in Ross Grey. I opened headquarters. Its major partner is FRS, and people who know rural Ireland well will know farm recruitment services, uh, who, of course, um, are the people who, who recruit um, people to work in agriculture, and, and they're the major, major partners in that. Uh, conglomerate, if you like, the one, the contract. A um, little bit confused by, by Senator Devine's remarks, um, uh, getting very upset at, at the, at the um, neoliberal idea that companies should be allowed to um, uh, bid for contracts, and God forbid it might be a foreign company, and even worse, a British one. Um, yet at the same time, you're, yeah, you're, the same time you're, you're very upset about Brexit. Not actually upset. You absolutely yeah. want to insist that Northern Ireland remains in the European Union. Yeah, no, big. please. Uh, you actually want to exist, <laughs> insist that Northern Ireland remains in the European Union. Um, exactly what is the European Union about? A fundamental principle of the European Union is the four freedoms. A freedom in the entire Union for the movement of capital, labour, services and goods. And the fact that any EU, EU, EU company can bid for a contract in other parts of the EU. So once again, you have this two-faced approach from Sinn Féin where you're determined to keep Northern Ireland uh, in the European Union, but you don't want the European Union to apply to anything we do, uh, particularly uh, um, a, a government contract. So that just makes absolutely no sense to me. I think Senator Rockwell talked about um, uh, the ETBs being, being very good and having a role, and I agree with that. And we have a lot of involvements with the ETBs, with the ETBs through, through our department, um, particularly when it comes to Springboard, for example, uh, people on the Back to, back to Education Allowance, um, uh, supporting them to take part in, in, ETB, in ETB programs. But the education and training boards are about education and training. Uh, job path is about activation. It's about recruitment. 
Uh, it's about job placement. So what they're doing is a very different service to, to, to that's provided by ETBs. Uh, Senator Dolan um, mentioned people with disabilities, uh, and he'll be aware, as the House will be aware, of some of the programs that we have in that regard. For example, the wage subsidy scheme, which um, pays employers or, or helps to subsidise the, the, the cost of employing people with disabilities, and also the adaption grants uh, that, um, that we provide employers to adapt their premises uh, so they can hire more people with disabilities. Um, but it's an area where I think we can do an awful lot more. Uh, um, uh, Professor Francis Rowan has, has just finished her, her Make Work Pay report, um, and that will be published in the first two weeks in April. And that assesses the enormous barriers to employment that exist for people with disabilities. Uh, for example, the loss of the medical card, or the fear of the loss of the medical card, the loss of the travel pass. Um, issues, for example, that people are very concerned that if, if, they, if they are on disability and they take up a job and it doesn't work out that they'll have great difficulty um, uh, getting back uh, onto their previous payment. And all those things are laid out very well in the report. Um, it will be jointly published um, uh, by me, Minister McGrath, and Mr. Harris in the coming weeks. And I intend to publish it with the policy response to the recommendations, not just the recommendations, but actually what we're going to do about them. And I think there actually are a lot of things um, in, in, in that area that, that could make a real difference um, for people with disabilities um, uh, in, in encouraging, encouraging them to take a work and giving them the assurance that if it doesn't work out, uh, they won't find themselves um, uh, adrift. Um, I, I, I'll have to come back to you with, with more detailed costings uh, on job path. I'll certainly give you any information um, uh, that I can. I did give the figure of 26.8 million for 2016, um, which obviously would have been, been the bulk of the cost. But I think, as the case with any program, it's not just about the cost, it's about the value, it's about what has it achieved. And I gave you the figures earlier. People referred to job path are 20% more likely to get a job than the control group of similar people who aren't. That's particularly true for people who are most distant from, distant from the labour market, those who are very long term unemployed, who are 40% more likely to get a job than the same sort of person, or the same type of person, or the same cohort of person who isn't referred to job path. So, as is the case with any service that the government pays for or provides, you have to consider what the value of it to. Uh, and I think that needs to be factored in, into any calculations. And uh, given the results to date, um, you know, I, I think this is going to be a very economic and financially advantageous program. Um, if the client has mental health issues or a disability that prevents them from working, uh, they can, of course, be referred back to the department and they can refer themselves back to the department uh, and apply for another payment, for example, disability allowance or an illness payment. And we are finding, and we're definitely finding it to be the case, uh, that as we work more intensively and engage one-to-one -one with many more people uh, who are on job seekers, we are finding more and more people who are on the wrong payment and actually should perhaps be on disability allowance or an illness payment or another payment. Um, and I suppose that was inevitable. You know, people could have been on job seekers for a very long time but it's, and continued to receive job seekers every week. But it's only when we made really hard efforts to get them into work that it became obvious that this isn't the right payment for them. And we have seen, as part of the reason for the increase in, in, in people on disability allowance, uh, is the fact that people have been migrating from job seekers to disability, um, and, and appropriately so in, in a lot of cases. Uh, the LES, what we're doing there is reducing the caseload. Uh, the local employment services uh, not too long ago had a caseload of over 1,000 people per one officer. Um, I don't know how anyone could possibly do that job, 1,000 people uh, per one uh, caseworker. So we're trying to get LES down to um, a race of about 1 to 150. Uh, and LES will be kind of going back to what it did at the start, which is to work very intensively with the people who are most distant from the labour market, who need the most support. And if I was a caseworker, um, that's the kind of ratio I'd rather be working with, 150 people at any one time, not having 1,000 people on your books. I don't know how you could actually uh, operate a service on that basis. Uh, Indicon is carrying out a, a full review of the LES, um, and we'll ha have that this year. And I should say, from statistics that I do have, uh, there is a lot of variation in performance uh, when it comes to the LES. Some produce very good results, some don't, are actually pretty poor. Uh, and one thing I do like about the job pack contract is it is payment by results, and the taxpayer only pays for results. And uh, that's not the case with LES, um, where the taxpayer has to pay anyway, uh, even if LES is unsuccessful uh, in getting people into work. And there's huge variation in success rates uh, from one LES uh, to the other. Um, I think uh, as, uh, Senator Higgins um, mentioned that job pad could be um, scaled up very rapidly, and that's correct. That's one of the advantages, in fact, 
uh, of having a private contractor is it can be scaled up uh, very quickly and they're able to scale up a service uh, extremely quickly and that's um, exactly, exactly what they did, done at a time of high unemployment when it was needed and at a time of a public sector recruitment, recruitment uh, uh, barrier. Also, one of the advantages of being a private contract as well is it can be scaled down very quickly uh, if we don't need it anymore or as much as we need now in the future. When you take people on as public servants, uh, it's much harder to flex up and flex down. Um, and of course, there's pension issues, there's employment issues, um, buildings and so on. So what this system allows us to do is to have intro, have our own people, our own officials and our own buildings providing a core level of service that will always be needed. And then we can use contractors like JobPath to scale up or scale down, depending uh, on how much additionality uh, we need and how much unemployment there is. And that's, that's a pretty standard thing you'll see happen in big organizations, particularly in the private sector, that have their own workforce and their own buildings. That's core. And they flex up and down as they need to, uh, according to demand. Um, and, and it's a core flex approach that we're really taking in, the, in that regard. It also makes it easier to become adaptable as well. Uh, if we want job path to do different things, for example, uh, in the future. Um, on, on, um, on EU, EU procurement law, um, I'm not an expert in that field, um, and I'm told by my, um, my officials that's a complicated question with a complicated answer, so I'll have to come back to you with a better answer than that. Um, but um, uh, what I am told is, is a public or personal service delivery contracts are, are not excluded from the requirement to abide by EU public procurement rules. Um, however, there is a higher threshold for the requirement to go to, um, to, go to uh, um, EU-wide tender. Uh, finally, on the issue of exiting job path, there, there are a number of ways, obviously, to exit job path. Uh, you exit automatically after a year. Um, you can take up a job, you can sign off, or you can apply for alternative payments. For example, disability, uh, the back-to-education allowance, or the back-to-work enterprise allowance, uh, which a lot of people do. So I hope I've answered as many questions as I can, and I've noted a few things that, um, uh, that I'll follow up on um, by correspondence. Thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for taking the time to come and debate this important issue with us this evening.